is no accident podcast i'm your host maritza perez and we are here today with an amazing woman who converts entrepreneurs passion into powered leadership her name anita topes the vibrant force behind passion powered leadership coaching as the acclaimed passionista anita infuses her work with boundless energy and profound dedication to results. As a professionally certified coach and five professional in talent development, she is not just a coach, she is a dynamic facilitator and co-author of Experts and Influencers in Leadership. Anita guides leaders from all levels to amplify their presence, communicate effectively, and foster robust team man engagement. Her approach draws from emotional intelligence, conversational intelligence, and positive intelligence for transformative results and a strong leadership mindset. With over 20 years in talent development, Anita's passion power formula for leadership success creates profitable results by cultivating passionate leaders, powerful communication, and productive team. Elevate your leadership journey with Anita, where <laughs> passion meets. Anita, welcome to My Accent is No Accident podcast. It is a big honor to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Maritza. I'm excited to be here. I am very excited for today's um, interview because I love what you do and I have um, gotten to meet you um, in the last few months. And I really, really love your passion, your energy and, and the way you see the leadership. It's totally mm -hmm. different. But before we jump into all this, Anita, I would like to ask you my theme question. Okay. Anita, what is your accent and why is not an accident? Wow. Okay. That is a great question and I really love it. I would start with first where I am from. As most um, Latinas, uh, we automatically try to find out, okay, where are you from? Are you Dominican? Are you Puerto Rican? This and that or Colombian. <laughs> And we're always trying to figure that out. And for me, my story is my parents were born and raised in New York. I mean, in Puerto Rico. And then they moved to New York and had their family there. And growing up in my family, I remember my mom and my dad, who my dad was the educator, my mom was the homemaker. And they enforced, or not enforced, but really, helped us thrive in English. So my first language is English. And I, I suspect you don't really know that I speak Spanish until I start speaking Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I just remember that as I became a young adult and started looking for work, I realized, wow, I need to really master my Spanish. And, and I, I just felt so insecure about it because I didn't sound as good as other people. <laughs> so I kept it quiet, knowing that my parents, I mean, reflecting back on why my parents made that decision, I suspect they wanted us to fit in, in school, in our work, in all different areas, rather than be challenged with learning um, English if you're Spanish speaking first. 
So I, I am grateful that they did that. But at the same time, I'm like, I really want to be masterful in this beautiful language. So from, from that point is where, especially in my younger years of a young adult working, I really was hiding the fact that I could speak Spanish and that I understood everything. And it took me a lot of years to not, to have the courage to say that I speak Spanish because I, I compared myself to other people speaking Spanish. I definitely wasn't confident in my own Spanish language and, and speaking. I could read it, I did, but I was so terrified to speak it in public or with anyone that was so much better than me. So I really felt like a fraud during those days. And <laughs> to wrap up that question, when the whole social justice um, occurred with the George Floyd events, that's when it hit me that I'm not honoring who I am and bringing my whole self to every situation, including my business. And so I finally came out of the Bible closet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I started promoting myself as a bilingual speaker. Um, and I'm grateful that I finally feel confident. Uh, and now I know that, you know, my mistakes in grammar or accent would, would be, would be okay. Because I'll, be the first one to say, hey, help me out with this word, please. <laughs> yes. And that's how I became very comfortable with my accent, which is no accident. And that also led to my chin in my practice to help others realize their authentic selves and be passionate about it. Amazing. I love that. I love that because um, authenticity make us, makes everything easier for everybody. If you are authentic and you don't try to hide who you are and you try to thrive as you are everywhere, it gives you a sense of belonging. That was one of the things that we were talking about, mm -hmm. how belonging is so important in leadership. Would you like to talk a little more about Yes, yes. And I'm glad that you brought up belonging first, because I'm a big ally and advocate for EIB initiatives. And if I could flip the words or the letters around, I would always start with belonging. I feel that that's the most important step in acceptance of people coming into the workplace or into a family, you know, or into a community. Just really embracing everyone for who they are. And, and, and going back to my example, embrace, it begins with embracing myself too, that I could um, be of who I am with anyone. Okay. And so belonging is so critical. And I, and I think back to with my parents' decision to um, help us speak English articulately uh and i f and i feel today they're not alive to confirm this but i feel today that it was their action for us to feel like we belong and there's a twist to that because i felt like wait i have to assimilate to the american culture versus feel long does that make sense yes yes but yes. I think their, yes. their intention was to help me feel like I belonged wherever I went in school or clubs or anything. So, but it really is a big distinction between really feeling like you belong and assimilating. Which, because assimilating is, is forced into you. Right. And then, but when you are able and you're given the opportunity to be who you are, to be authentic, to bring your accent, what I call the accent, to be, to bring that sauce about you, 
to bring the boldness, yeah. the, the, the shy and timid you, um, that gives you the opportunity to feel like others actually are okay with you and accept you and value you for who you are, not for who you are pretending to be. Exactly. Um, and uh, and in today's world, we know that um, people with multiple languages uh, thrive throughout mm -hmm. their careers uh, precisely because they speak different languages. Right. I was I was speaking the other day with a friend that is um uh the, she is from France but her husband is from Germany and mm. her daughter was their daughter was born in in um Denmark I think it was wow. so they speak four or five languages all of them and they lived in Spain. Now they live here in US. They lived in Colombia. So mm -hmm. they speak in, in the, their Spanish is really good. <laughs> <laughs> they speak like, like if they were from Spain. They lived there for a while. So mm -hmm. when I met them here and I said, Wait, where are you from? And they said something beautiful. They said, we're from the world. Nice. I love that. We're <laughs> from the world. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yes. <laughs> so, and they were talking about that, that they had to assimilate many cultures. And, and it was right. every time they change of a culture is difficult. So mm -hmm. now let's put that into the cultural behavior in the workplace, in the coaching business. Right. How does the culture of influence the coaching business? Wow. Well, I'll tell you, it it really influences in in many aspects. In in the sense that, um, as a Latina, and maybe you could relate to this, we are open people, <laughs> uh, and we embrace people like literally embrace with hugs, right? Yes. and embrace people because we're curious and we're so anxious to get to know that person and hear their story and i, I there is like this quick question that happens you know in our culture do you see that at all yes, when you yes, meet people yes, like, yes. you know and so i think that our culture really influences who we show up to be in the work that we do and going back to that authenticity. And then that comes out in the expression. So within the profession of coaching, there's a real importance to building that relationship and establishing the rapport early on in the conversation. And then the other piece that I think culture uh, supports is I meet so many people in my practice and I we can't make the assumption that because I'm looking at your name that has last name Perez or my name Torres, we can't assume that you identify as a Latina, because yes. that would really cause some challenges. Yes. So one of the, the ways that I address in the coaching session, especially in the early part of the engagement, is to understand, tell me a little bit about your culture. And that starts to open up such curiosity about each other's cultures. Yes. And and that's just a that is what works for me in building that rapport, building that safety uh, to work with me because I'm always going to honor who you are. And and you know you just touch a very important point in that that talks about diversity. Diversity is not about us with everybody. Mm -hmm. It's about exploring. 
and mm -hmm. knowing and accepting, but I, I'm going to change that acceptance to valuing yeah. others for who they are. So what, how do you value others for who they are? Getting to know them right. and realizing and acknowledging who they are. That doesn't make you change who you are. That doesn't, and like, it doesn't make you be like them. Right. You just now know where they are coming from and what they want to do and why they do things the way they do it. And the other part, and you're probably going to agree with me uh, on this, is you also know how to approach them. Yeah, that's very important. And, Absolutely. And, yes, and that is a, an important part in leadership, how mm -hmm. to approach others. How do you um, coach leaders on these these differences in cultures? How how do you help them uh, be like this mix of a leadership that allows others to belong mm -hmm. and to be part of the team? Yes, the biggest part that I feel is critical as a leader who is committed to uh, ensuring people are valued and appreciated, it starts with the leader himself or herself. I really feel, and this is my, my phrasing, leadership in all aspects begins from the inside out. So the more we can leaders understand themselves and enhance their self-awareness and their curiosity so that they could really get to know their people, the, the, the better it will be for them in setting that example for others. You just said something beautiful, and I, I love it. You said that the leader first has to has to know themselves right before they can leader and be a leader to others. They need to believe in themselves and they need to know themselves. How what what a beautiful concept because uh, sometimes we see that that authenticity mm -hmm. is built by something they are not and it's not really who they are but mm -hmm. who people want them to be. Right, exactly. And that brings me to a typical challenge that some leaders that I've coached struggle with, and that's feeling like there are imposters, right? Many leaders also uh, move into people leadership roles from being a very technical, knowledgeable expert, but lack some of those people skills to really connect. And there becomes this, um, I guess this wall of, of lack of confidence or fraud, feeling like the imposter that pulls them back from truly connecting to others. And so, for leaders to get past that, we have to help them understand they themselves, like how do these feelings, which are very normal. I mean, our my mission is to normalize this whole idea of imposter syndrome. Uh, many of us, because we're all human, we go through that, you know? I mean, I felt like an imposter uh, speaking Spanish when I knew I didn't sound very good. <laughs> And I knew I didn't know all the verbs in the right places, you know, but I was terrified. And so therefore I never told anybody, right? So I had yeah. my own story of, of imposter syndrome. And that's why um, that's just gonna be the biggest, the biggest place to start. So leaders who want to be better leaders have to be committed to expanding their 
the, their own knowledge about themselves and what them so that they can lead effectively. And, and that, that is wonderful because that also creates a fire in their heart to be able mm -hmm. to, to explore their creative selves right. and then um, discover their passions, which yes. is what you do. <laughs> so <Right>. how, <laughs> how would you explain to our audience how can your passion become your best um i will say ace under your sleep when you're a leader mm, okay well uh helping people discover their passions is a very um revealing process okay and again some leaders are kind of promoted into this people leadership role not even realizing what they what they love what they value right or even knowing what their core values are that's going to help them align their life and actions and behaviors around so when when i ask a leader that i'm coaching what lights you up <laughs> What gets your mojo going about leadership? Mm -hmm. And I often hear cricket. It's a okay. very, it's a question that causes some leaders to step back and say, you know, I, I, I don't really know what I'm, I mean, outside of my family, which everybody says, I don't really know what I'm passionate about. And that's where we begin the work, because when you can do your passions, which are also represented by your core values, then you know you live your life aligned by those passions and nothing else. It's, is, it's, it's an easy process. It's effortless. <laughs> and and you, this is beautiful because I feel right now that like you're talking to me, <laughs> <laughs> which you are talking, but you know, directly to me because um, throughout the years um, when I was in corporate and I moved to smaller companies and trade companies, I was looking for something and, mm -hmm. and I realized and, and, and many of the managers in the big corporations uh, they always put me to do something that was towards training others training process, others training others okay um and then also um facilitating processes nice and things like that and i always was like i always thrive on those things and and now that I have my company, I, I can tell that I have never been happier. No. I guess what I'm doing every day, those three things that I loved. Wow. These years. And I never knew that was my passion until I had to face a laid off and said, okay, that that gig that I had as an extra money maker is going to become my company. Wow, that's so, awesome. <laughs> so I never knew. So really, sometimes finding your passion is easier than you know. Like if you look back of mm -hmm. what have you done that it really like makes you happy, mm -hmm. but even realize. Yes, yes, you don't. You're just kind of going through the motions, but without that self-awareness. And what's awesome about your sharing uh, is that your your passion that you didn't know to call it a passion at the time led into your purpose. Yes, exactly. And that's that's the pathway to really get clear on what matters most in your life and in your work so that you could really wake up each day 
as, as I've heard many times, when you love the work you do, it's no longer a job. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then hours pass until somebody goes, I have to put alarms in my in my phone to 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 hey, have you have lunch? I think right. one, one time we were meeting, I'm like, I'm sorry, this is my alarm <laughs> telling me have you had lunch? Uh, so going then now, let's go to to what are the qualities mm. that really bring Hispanic coaches what that that make them foster that sense of community? Yes, okay. Well, I think that uh, we have a way to just instantly connect. And whether we're from the same country or not, there's an instant connection because the language, if it's there, and even if it's not, uh, is that way in to building that relationship. I also think um, we are naturally curious. Yeah. There's so many other um, Hispanic friends and coaches that I know that have different stories around how they became or immigrated to the United States. It, so many of us are hard workers and we persevere. Our resilience is so strong from many of the challenges that we've had um, throughout. And so I feel that, that those are the qualities to make us better listeners, to fall in love with people for who they are immediately, um, and asking curious questions about where did you come from and how was your passage? <laughs> <laughs> what challenges did you have when you were growing up? You know, there's so many of us that like to share how our language, um, our language barrier or language, um, the way we were raised yes. was so different. It's so it different. different. Yes. You know, I, I know many coaches that speak incredible Spanish and then feel the lack of confidence when they speak English, right? So, so we all go through it, but those are the qualities I think that makes our Hispanic culture so, so amazing in, in this profession. I just absolutely people for who they are and who they're not. <laughs> and I learned that from my parents, you know, like that total acceptance of who they yes, are. Yes. Yes. And, and that is something really nice about us um, Lat Latinos and Hispanic that we're very welcoming. Uh, mm. My husband is American and um, North American and he is we're talking about how our both countries we raised up and, and the native and he said what is the difference and I, I made a joke but it's mm -hmm. kind of true and I said, well, what we did in 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 Colombia was we uh, we kind of like enchanted the his the the Spaniels, and they became our husbands and never went back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. so many stayed uh, and never went back. Many. Yes, many robbed us and, and the whole story, uh, but many of them stayed and never went back. And that's why we're like um, cafe con leche and we're yeah. a little lighter. Uh, some of us are, are lighter, like you, you're you lighter, but we when we go to the beach, we get a very nice bronze tan. Right. Yeah, so, we do. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so I was telling him, that is the difference, and then that's how we still are. We see somebody from outside of our country or outside of our circle, mm -hmm. and we're like, hey, are you alone? Hey, what are you doing? What is your name? Where do you come from? That's you true. Know? And we always, and then we go to, for instance, people from Central America, Mexico, Guatemala, 
And the very first thing they call you is amiga, venga, you know. Mm -hmm. So everybody's friends, everybody's good until they're not. Right. <laughs> good, <laughs> good point. That's right. We are friends instantly until they're not. And and that's some that's also a, a very trusting aspect of our culture. We have a yeah. very trusting way of being with people right off the bat. Uh, that's awesome. I'm really <laughs> glad to, to hear that. And and you know you touched upon how we include everyone, right? And I remember being in grade school and never allowing any kids eat alone. Very so good, yes. I would say, come, you don't have to come, you know, eat with us or go, go here with us. We never wanted to see anybody on their own. And that's part of what be, you know, belonging means like that's the first yes. step of belonging. Yes. And I, I was characterized as the social butterfly in grade school and throughout high school uh, because I was never in any one clique. I had friends from all the categories. <laughs> yes. So it was I it was also um, they, my father called me Mariposa because of that. I, I had my friends from the sport teams. I had my friends from the youth group, which it was the Catholic. Right. I, I grew up Catholic. Then the the friends from the choir, the friends from the dance club, the yeah. dance from the theater club. You know, everybody. And then yeah. my friends. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it is. We are all inclusive. Um, okay. Some of us are maybe not because change, today's world is a little different. Mm. But there are also many other things that bring us challenges as leaders. And in 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 well, maybe that's the second question. But the first question is, what are the challenges that we as Hispanic face as leaders? Wow. Well, what what I have experienced um, personally first is uh, I, I can't say that I've had a challenge feeling accepted in any company I went to or worked in through my career. But I also attribute it to <laughs> my fear of well not my fear but my uh, my ability to assimilate as well so for example i hear you don't sound spanish you speak <laughs> really good english <laughs> and i go yes and i speak spanish and so there's always this like assumption people make sometimes around um, the, you know, what we have to deal with. So for me, I felt, I felt, I've always felt accepted. And I know that that acceptance came as a result of my hiding in the closet as a bilingual. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Now, with other challenges that I hear from the leaders that I coach that are Hispanic, uh, they, they do face acceptance. They do face um, discrimination in all different categories, right? Uh, ageism is, an, is one, um, being seen as a viable candidate for promotions and getting to that next level of leadership. Um, it, it, it's just a real challenge. Uh, and, and my twist around helping get through those challenges is the more we own our voice and our own power for the strengths and skills and knowledge we know we've gained through the years, that's what's going to help break that. Yes, yes. 
So what you're saying is, um, although we do have challenges, we like to break the barrier and we don't give up. And that, that that's beautiful. Thank exactly. You we, we can't give up, right? So can I share another personal story around yeah. my own uh, fear of being compared or not standing out? For example, <laughs> with my own imposter syndrome, you see that I brand myself as the passionista. Yes. Well, the way that came about was when I worked with a business coach several years ago when I started building my practice. And, <clears throat> and we were working towards how do I brand myself? Like, how do I really get out there and, and, and brand myself in a way that with one word, people will get what I'm so committed to? And she gave me the most amazing exercise to do. And that was to go back through all my uh, kudo cards, uh, testimonials, my performance evaluations, any emails that people, people shared with me around uh, their experience of me. So good feedback. And my job was to find the top five adjectives that they would say in their, in their experience of me. And the one common adjective that almost everyone used was passion. Aww. Because I bring my passion to everything that I do. So when she said, the business coach says, that's it. That's who you are, Anita. You are the Anita the Passionista. And I went, I went, my gut dropped. And I went, I can't go out there and tell people I'm Anita the Passionista. <laughs> it was like my imposter syndrome just dived into my gut and my head. And I'm like, oh, my God, I can't do that. I don't know. And she goes, what holds you back, Anita? This is what people already say about you. So yes, you can own it. You can own it and be proud of it because that's who you are. Well, Maritza, it took me a year to have the courage and the confidence to use my brand as a need of the passionista. A whole year. And that was my own imposter syndrome uh, keeping me from holding back. And once I, <laughs> once I came out with it, people were like, yes, that's you. I love it. Yes, that's you. In fact, she had me call some of my corporate clients and ask them what they thought about my new brand. And they said, of course, Anita, that's who you are. And so <laughs> I was holding myself back. And my, I would say another cultural barrier that we have is, is how we see ourselves. Because yes. oftentimes how others see us is more uh, accurate than what we're saying to ourselves. Yes, I will say you just said something beautiful. And I, I loved your story because it tells us that also we do have an, an imposter syndrome right? Uh, as a culture where we think we don't belong. And probably we do, but we think we don't. Exactly. So when we think we are not sufficient, but we are, and everybody else is saying, that, yes, you are. What are you talking about? Who told you that? Myself. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we are our own worst critics. And it's all in here. You know, those inner conversations that we have is what causes us to self-sabotage our own progress and our own impact that we continue, that we could continue to have, so. Exactly, exactly. And I love our conversation. And another thing that I wanted to ask you before we go to the end is, mm -hmm. how does a corporate take a coach that is not, 
uh, that is a Hispanic coach. Does the, 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 do you have challenges in that aspect? Um, I, I guess I would need a, a little bit more clarification. So you're asking what, what so, so when you are like saying, uh, okay, I am, I am Anita Passionista. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Anita Torres. Do you mm -hmm. see any hesitant on, but how are you going to develop this? Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Personally, I have to say no. And the reason I'm saying no is because I'm, I did my work, my inner work, my own inner work. And I continue to do my own inner work, all right? This is a journey, it's not a destination to continue to develop a growth mindset and to learn and more and more about yourself and to build that confidence and reduce those fear-based thoughts and feelings. It's always an ongoing journey to do that. And so I don't feel that now because I stand in my power. And that's one of the reasons why my practice is all around passion powered leadership because it, and that's authenticity beautiful. is the best is the first place and only yeah. place to start i love that so um my second question was but you just answer it my, my my question next to it would be how would you tell somebody that mm. is feeling that way yes yes and and it be it, again it begins with how willing are you leader how willing are you to do the inner work here's an example i've had leaders say i want to when i ask the question which is always the first question around what do you want to accomplish uh or what outcome do you want to achieve in this coaching session many times they'll say i want to learn how to uh have my team members relate to each other more right and i say that's a great you know that's a great goal that's a great goal and then one of the follow-up questions as the conversation progresses is okay great so how are you like how are you what actions are you taking to relate to your team members individually and as a group. Oh no, we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about my team. <laughs> and that's one of the, I would say go back to the leadership challenges. That's one of the challenges that some leaders, especially new people leaders, feel it's not about who, who they bring to the table of themselves but what their team is expected to do. And it doesn't work that way. If you're a leader, you also need to do the work that you expect yes. your others to do when it comes to relationship building, collaboration, teamwork, and productivity. It all relates to how well that leader is committed to knowing himself and knowing each person on their team what they like what they don't like what their strengths are it, it, it it's all around conversation and connection and that is beautiful i love that because it is important for the leader to mm -hmm. be the one seeking to look for the things from their team members not for the team member to come to the leader and you know, like, oh, this is what I want. Mm -hmm. um, although Hispanics were really good at it. Hey, this is what I want. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, but, but <clears throat> um, it's just about them coming out of their office, they coming out of that shell mm -hmm. and being with the people in That's any true. level. Right. And, and we level. all are leaders. And we all mm -hmm. are leaders. So we also have to see ourselves as um, each one of us is, is the leader in what we do. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you said that because that is another belief that I have around you don't need a title to be a leader. You just need to be willing to demonstrate 
the leadership qualities that have you show up as a leader. Because a leader is, is, is accomplishes their goals through others. And my favorite quote, if I say it correctly, is, is from, um, Quin I think it's Quincy Adams, our, old, our president, past president. And he goes, um, if, if, how is it? Uh, if, you, if you're, no, if your people are willing to learn more, do more, be more, right? Then your actions will inspire. I got to find the quote to say it correctly because I <laughs> love this quote, right? This is one of my favorites and you would think I should memorize it by now, but uh, it's just a met, uh, an amazing quote. Okay. Yes. And it, it sounds promising. So in it the is. meantime, in the uh -huh. meantime, we're getting close to the end and I would like to mm -hmm. give you an opportunity to talk about your upcoming Workshop. Oh yes, thank you. Um, I found the quote, so let me just say that. So okay. if if you're the leader, right? If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, then you truly are a leader. And I so believe that one hundred percent. Oh, that's that is a, that that is it. <laughs> that's it. That is right. It. That's it. You have you have to inspire others. Absolutely. And so with my workshop, my colleague and I, my colleague is named Marielle Gautier and with Redworks Coaching, she and I are both passionate about this whole uh, framework around imposter syndrome because we hear it all the time with many of the clients that we coach. And so we're, we designed a program to help leaders to beat imposter syndrome and power up their leadership presence. And so we're working hard to get this program out to as many people. We're, we focus on women leaders. We invite uh, all leaders uh, to explore the concept around beating imposter syndrome, which begins with mastering, those, managing those negative thoughts. Right. And that lack of confidence, that self-doubt and that feeling like a fraud. Those are the feelings and thoughts that hold us back from really showing up as powerful leaders. Amazing. I love that. So, Anita, is there anything oh, how people how can people contact you? Oh, yes, sure, sure. Um, well, my email is Anita at passion powered past tense powered leadership.com and you can go to my website at passionpoweredleadership.com and look at under events to get details learn more and register for the upcoming workshop amazing thank you so much anita this has been beautiful would we'll you like to leave the audience with the last uh, thought or uh, something that you would like them to get inspired by <laughs> my my final thought would be wake up every morning embracing and loving who you are no matter what amen to that thank you so much anita for today for your time thank you so much marissa this was fun amazing and to you watching and watching us remember that you came into this world to be loved to love mm -hmm. one another and to give more and more love till next time bye bye hi is maritza here if you like this episode of my accent is no accident podcast and would like to listen more like this Subscribe wherever you're listening to it or watching it. Leave us a nice review and share with your friends, family, and network. Thanks for listening. Hello.